Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to class. Good to see some faces. Siddhan, don't put off your... <laughs> Oh, you're sitting on the teacher's uh, table and chair. No, no problem. Uh, but good to see some faces. It really it, uh, kind of brings some color on the screen, some life. It's really nice. Thank you. Okay, so let's begin. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Yeah, sure, please. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace. Lord, we surrender everything to you. We surrender our life to your word of grace, that word which is able to build us. Let your word ignite us, build us like never before. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. So today we're going to be looking at uh, Romans chapter 13. Uh, in Romans chapter 13, Paul is basically talking about uh, the believer and the government. Okay. Uh, it has to do, so Romans chapter 13 is basically about uh, uh, civic uh, authorities or government authorities. Uh, other than First Peter chapter 2, this is the primary place uh, in the New Testament where there is uh, so much teaching on uh, civic authorities or uh, the government. So the other, only other place in the New Testament is there's a little more in-depth teaching about uh, the government and how we need to relate to the government is in First Peter chapter 2 and uh, Romans chapter 13 is the only other uh, place. And we know that uh, Paul is writing to the believers in Rome and the Rome, uh, Rome was ruled by the Roman emperor. And we know that the Roman emperors uh, were not godly people. They were actually, uh, sorry, but terrible people. Uh, and at this point, when, uh, when uh, Paul was, the apostle Paul was writing the church at Rome, uh, Nero was in power. And we've heard about the wickedness of, uh, of Rome, of uh, Nero, especially towards the Christians. Uh, he was very harsh and cruel in his treatment towards the Christians. Uh, you know, he even made uh, Christians as torches to light up his his gar uh, his garden. Uh, so, you know, they were uh, uh, Christians were put on on poles and they were lit as torches uh, to light his uh, garden. They were also used as an entertainment. Um, they were they were made a sport of. Uh, they would release these uh, Christians into the open arena uh, where there would be a wild animal or, uh, you know, these warriors would come and they would you know, beat them up or, uh, you know, these uh, Christians would run for their life from here to there and animals would run behind them. So it would be like a sporting event um, in the Roman world and people would enjoy it. And so they would made a sport of uh, uh, the Christians. And eventually uh, we also know that uh, one of the Roman generals around AD 70 uh, destroyed uh, Jerusalem. So um, the Roman government were uh, not kind uh, and godly. They were not fair or just. Uh, so for Paul to write the words that he writes or uh, what he's asking us to do uh, and how he's asking us to uh, you know, uh, her attitude towards the, uh, the the Roman government or to the government is quite astounding because uh, understanding uh, the situation that the church at Rome were facing, the people, the believers, the Christians were facing, and for Paul to write this is quite astounding. But we know that it's not uh, Paul's own words, but it's the words of God. It's the the Holy Spirit imparting to Paul, and hence, uh, uh, you know, even as we read this in our context today, uh, you know, we need to see how it applies to our uh, day and uh, time as well. Okay, so with this introduction, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 13 verses um, 1 following. Uh, can somebody read verses 1 to verse 7, please, of Romans chapter 13? Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. 
Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear this word in vain. For he is a servant of God, and an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all who is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, uh, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom God, to, honor to whom. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asha. So in um, verse 1, we see that Paul is uh, uh, writing to the church in Rome and he's saying, be subject to the governing authorities, okay, which means uh, be submitted to uh, the civic authorities, to the governing um, authorities, which means no questions asked, you know. Uh, what if they're a good, a bad government? What if the wicked government, an evil government? Uh, should we submit to them? So he's not qualifying which kind of government. He just says, you know, be subject or submit uh, to the governing uh, authorities. Um, and the view that uh, Paul brings to us is that, you know, uh, is that he's appointed uh, by God, that you know, the government authorities are appointed uh, by God. He says there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So why is he saying that, you know, irrespective of what kind of government, whether they are a good government, fair, just government, or whether a wicked or cruel government, he says that we need to submit to the civic authorities, to the governing authorities. Um, and the view that Paul brings here is because they are appointed by God. Who is the, the they? Uh, it's the the, uh, the the government, the rulers, uh, those in authority. They are uh, appointed by God. They are in that place because God has allowed them, has permitted them. And hence, he says, you know, we need to submit to governing uh, authorities. And in verse 2, he says, you know, those who resist the authority, uh, the governing authority uh, resists the ordinances of God. That means he's saying uh, the ordinance here is meaning the institution of God. Uh, so he's basically saying that, you know, is, the authorities are part of the institution that God has instituted. God has instituted, just like he's instituted marriage, he's instituted uh, the government uh, and whoever is uh, uh, part of this, uh, who's ruling uh, in this institution of God, you know, uh, we need to uh, submit to them. And in verse 2, he says, don't resist them. Okay, uh, so Paul mentions to us that the civic government in in verse 1, verse 2, verse 4, and verse 6, he says, are appointed by God. Uh, they are an institution of God. Uh, and, you know, in verse 6, he says they are God's ministers. If you look at uh, uh, verse 6, it says, um, for, uh, you know, he says, uh, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. So he Paul refers to the uh, those in leadership in the government as somebody who is appointed by God, uh, they are part of the institution of God and they are uh, God's ministers. Okay, so they are basically uh, instruments in God's hand, uh, regardless of the form of the government, whether it's a government which is a monarchy or a democratic government or a dictatorship uh, government or a socialist government, whatever it is, uh, Paul does not mention any qualifiers here. And it's also wrong for us to put any qualifiers, but whatever form of the government uh, and those in authority, uh, we need to view them or we need to see government officials as uh, according to what the word of God says and what Paul is revealing here to us uh, by the revelation or through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that they are appointed by God, uh, they are an institution of God and they are God's ministers. So as believers, what must we do? 
uh, in verse 1, Paul says we need to be subject to governing authorities. In verse 2, he says don't resist them, don't oppose them, don't fight against them. Okay. In verse 3, he says do what is good. And in verse 7, he says render uh, therefore all that is due. That means pay your taxes. You have to pay your money, you have to pay your taxes, uh, you pay your taxes. I know many of them... Um, in our country especially are very disappointed because we pay huge amount of taxes uh, for in everything and everything you know whether we buy uh, medicines or whether we buy clothes or shoes or even some bakery items we go to eat in the restaurant everything has uh, uh, tax we're also we're paying income tax road tax house tax and uh, the the sad thing is people are saying you know but there is no good infrastructure not even good quality roads uh, uh, that uh, people can drive safely you know many of these roads are the ones that are causing so much of um, of accidents and the people lose their lives uh, well it's very sad but paul is saying irrespective of what kind of government what they're doing uh, with our taxes uh, you know, uh, we need to uh, give them our taxes and also not only our taxes, our money, but also respect and honor, which is very, very difficult, right? Uh, for a government that is persecuting us, for a government that is not fair, that's not just, uh, that is holding up holding up all the wealth and the riches and, you know, people are in poverty, there is no infrastructure, there is no improvement whatsoever. You know, uh, we far from uh, come to a place where we can really respect or honor our government. But what does God's word teach us? God's word teaches us that we need to respect and honor them and not just only pay our um, taxes. Now, uh, when we read these, uh, this whole chapter where Paul is basically talking about the civic government, now there are many questions that come to our mind. There are several questions uh, with regard to the governing authorities. Uh, so in today's lesson, uh, we are just I'm just going to follow the notes that are there that has been given to you. So you can follow through with the notes. Um, you know, in the notes, there are some questions that have been raised up. Uh, so today we will just look at those questions uh, and we'll follow through with uh, the notes uh, for Romans chapter 13. OK, so let's consider some questions that uh, can be raised with regard to the governing authorities. Uh, in the first question that is given there in the notes is in what sense are governing authorities appointed by God, especially those who are, you know, when we look at wicked rulers, um, uh, rulers who are evil, uh, unjust rulers, uh, rulers who persecute Christians, uh, you know, uh, we can uh, raise up the question, are they appointed by God? Are they in a place where they're appointed by God? And now why are we raising up this question is because we just said, um, uh, that, you know, we just read uh, and what Paul writes is, you know, um, uh, he says that, you know, govern, governing authorities or civic uh, rulers, uh, authorities are appointed by God. They are uh, part of the institution of God and they are God's ministers. So uh, the, the possible question that can come up that we can raise up is, you know, are those who persecute Christians unjust, wicked, uh, evil rulers, those dictators, uh, you know, are they also appointed uh, uh, by God? So let's look at what uh, scripture tells us. We'll get an understanding about uh, this from scripture. The first one, uh, the first point that we can learn from scripture is God has instituted uh, governmental authority. Okay. Uh, you, If you remember in your uh, first year when you did... Uh, sorry, in your second year, when you studied about the uh, uh, kingdom of God um, and kingdom building, uh, you learned about kingdom government uh, in from that publication, uh, the kingdom of uh, God. And you we learned there that, you know, um, uh, all authority flows from God and God has instituted authoritative structures or authority structures in the home, uh, uh, in the body of Christ, that is in the local church, the church. Um, uh, God has instituted uh, his authority structure in the workplace uh, and also in the government and i hope you remember you know learning these four things and so uh, uh, god has uh, you know uh, 
uh, instituted uh, the authority structure at uh, home in the family but we know that uh, in the in the sight of god uh, husband and wife are both equal you know um, both of them are equal in the sight of God. Both of them, um, you know, can grow into Christ likeness. Both of them can receive salvation. Both of them um, can flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Both of them can manifest the fruit of the Spirit. So there is no uh, partiality. You know, there is no uh, male or female, uh, Jew or Greek. Uh, uh, you know, all are one in Christ Jesus. So even as a husband and wife are equal, but yet in God's authoritative structure or God's government at home, Home, we know that man is the head of the home okay he's a head and he's responsible he is supposed to be the prophet priest and the provider uh, he's supposed to fulfill his uh, responsibilities okay uh, in the same way in the church um, we know that all of us uh, are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, we're all part of the body of Christ. We're all saved by grace. We're all uh, heirs of God, co heirs uh, with Christ Jesus. But yet we see in the body of Christ, in the in the church, in the local church, that we have leaders, we have pastors who are in charge. And so there is a government structure even in the church. Okay, in the workplace, uh, we know there is leadership. Uh, uh, we know there are team leads, there are uh, managers, there are uh, you know, uh, senior uh, managers, and then, then there are CEOs and all of that. Uh, so there is a leadership, and as well in the government, we know there is in the, in the government there is different levels of authority that we find in the um, government. So the Bible tells us that you know these authority structures are from God. Uh, they have uh, God has permitted these, and He has instituted uh, them. Um, and through these authoritative structures or these authority structures, God will bring about his plans and his purposes. The purposes of God will grow in and through these authority uh, structures. But the ideal uh, is that, you know, uh, the head uh, uh, of uh, the authority structure uh, should submit themselves to uh, Christ, like we read in First Corinthians eleven, verse three, uh, uh, the head of a man is woman. Uh, so a woman must submit herself to uh, husband out of uh, her, uh, you know, her uh, her uh, her mm, her respect uh, or her uh, her love for God. And also, we see that the head of uh, man is Christ. Okay, so the head of man is Christ, uh, and the head of Christ is God. So even as man fulfills his uh, responsibility uh, towards his wife and his family, his children, uh, he needs to do, know that he is, uh, you know, uh, he is under an authority, and that is Christ. Okay, he is he is accountable to Christ. He's responsible uh, for what he does and says and behaves and acts. Uh, he's responsible to Christ, and we see that even Christ, uh, you know, the head of Christ is God, because when when Jesus became man, he submitted uh, his will. He submitted himself in obedience. Uh, in every area to the will of the uh, Father. So we see that the authority of Christ is uh, uh, is God, or the head of Christ is God. So this is uh, the ideal that we have. But you know, the, uh, and we know that the work of God flows through these authority structures. And the ideal would be that you know each one would submit themselves. Uh, to God, but this is in reality. This is not the practice. Uh, this may not be. We can find many homes where uh, the husband or the man, the father, is not in submission to Christ, is not walking according to the ways and the wills and the plan of God. Uh, you know, at church, hopefully, uh, there are pastors who are uh, ministering, who are uh, uh, you know, who are uh, serving uh, uh, in their submission out of their submission to Christ. At the workplace, you know, we have many of them who are in leadership who may not be in submission to Christ, and also as well in the government, we have leaders who are not in submission to Christ. So, though there is an ideal that you know. You know, if all of these leaders submit themselves to Christ, then everything works in perfect harmony and unity and oneness. But why do we see so much of wickedness and uh, 
discord and and monarchy and dictatorship and uh, uh, you know and all of that in different levels of leadership is because there is that ideal is missing that they are not submitting themselves to Christ. There is no submission uh, uh, to Christ. So only the you know the ideal is when everyone is uh, in submission, and when everyone in submission, when everyone is in submission, the purposes of God can be uh, fulfilled. Okay. The second thing is we need to recognize God's uh, permission. You know. Um, uh, you know, we need to know that uh, every leader is in leadership because um, God has permitted them. Without God's permission, they cannot be in that place of leadership. They cannot be in that place of um, uh, authority. So there is pro uh, providence uh, or permission of God uh, where he allows people to enter into that uh, place of authority. They can enter into that place of authority whether they deserve it or not, whether they have uh, gain that place of responsibility lawfully or unlawfully uh, <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> they are appointed by god in the sense that uh, you know they have been permitted by god uh, to be in that place of power and influence uh, but uh, god's permission does not uh, imply uh, God's approval of all the wrong thing that is being said or done or all the wicked thing that is being uh, said or uh, done. And we see this throughout scripture uh, that kings and rulers, you know, come into their place of leadership authority because uh, God permits them uh, to be in that place of leadership, of authority, of power uh, in that particular time and in that particular place. Uh, but there are times when God sovereignly uh, sets up one and we see in his own sovereignty, he puts up one, he raises up one and he brings down the other. Uh, and God sovereignly steers up kings and rulers to carry out uh, their own specific purposes. We just look at that in, in a little bit. We look at a few examples, um, uh, uh, you know, regarding this point. But if you look at uh, Psalms chapter 75, that's given in your notes, Psalms chapter uh, 75, verses 6 and 7. Can one of you please read that, please? Psalm 75, 6 and 7. For not from the east or from the west, not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who excuses judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. Thank you. So we see that uh, God is a judge. He's the one who puts down a person and he exalts and other. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, uh, he's, it's, uh, it reads like this. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, uh, he says, most uh, high rules, the most high rules in the kingdom of men, he gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men so here we see that you know god in his sovereignty sets up uh, a ruler sets up one in position he can set up one person he can bring down the other um, and then he can also you know move their hearts uh, to bring out his specific plans and um, purposes just for a few examples uh, you know we know that pharaoh was in that place uh, at that given time, uh, and uh, we see that God uses, uh, uh, you know, to uh, the Pharaoh to display his uh, power, uh, his signs, miracles, and wonders, even though uh, we know that God permitted him to be in that place in that uh, for that season, that time, uh, even though Pharaoh was hard-hearted, you know, but we see that uh, irrespective of that, you know, we just see that, you know, uh, uh, God displays his power. 
Saul and David, uh, we know that uh, King Saul was made king. Uh, he got chosen as king, but when he disobeyed God, uh, he lost the anointing and David was um, anointed as king. But uh, we also read how Saul, the rest of his life, you know, uh, he acted out of uh, jealousy and, uh, you know, he wanted to, uh, he was continually on the run to, uh, you know, to get David out the way, to kill him. Um, and we see twice when uh, David uh, had the opportunity to king, uh, kill King Saul, uh, he did not because he recognized him as the Lord's uh, anointed. He recognized King Saul as in the place of God-given authority and position that God had instituted himself and put uh, King Saul there himself. Uh, and, uh, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, we see God uses him uh, to judge uh, the people of Israel, to take them as captives, to destroy um, uh, Israel. Uh, we also see that he's brought to a place where he recognizes God uh, as the true God when, you know, he... Um, uh, after his dream, when he uh, continues to live in pride, where he lives as a, uh, you know, as an animal, like a wild animal in the in the forest, and then comes to his senses, he acknowledges the power of the true and living God. And then he's uh, uh, restored back to his position as king. And we also see King Cyrus, the Persian king, uh, you know, who God moved his heart to send back uh the jews back to jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple and to dwell in uh, jerusalem so we see that god you know working uh, out his purposes irrespective of uh, who the king or the ruler or the government is but we need to note that not everything these leaders say and not everything these leaders did uh, you know, was from God. Uh, in some way, they were used by God uh, to carry out uh, his purposes, even though they were not perfect uh, people or perfect um, leaders. Okay, let's look at an example about uh, how Jesus spoke uh, about Pontius Pilate, the Roman government, uh, go Roman, Roman uh, governor uh, over Judea when uh, Jesus was brought before a Pilate uh, in John chapter 19, verse 10 to 11. Um, you know, uh, Jesus tells Pilate, uh, are you not, then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Uh, do you not know I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? So this is what Pilate is telling Jesus. And Jesus answers in John chapter 19, verse 11, you have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from uh, above. So what Jesus is saying, and Jesus is acknowledging that, you know, Pilate is there in his position, in his leadership authority, in leadership role at that time, that season, it's because the farm Father has permitted him uh, to be there uh, to do so. Okay, uh, and he's telling Pilate that you know, uh, you know, you are in this position because my father has allowed it, but you are res will be responsible for the decisions that you um, make. Okay, and he says that it's not only. Uh, uh, you who is going to be responsible for this decision that you're going to take regarding me but it says therefore the one who deceived me to you has the greater sin so here who, who, uh, jesus is not mentioning or referring to the father um, because the father cannot sin uh, but here he's talking about the jewish leaders and uh, judas uh, who's with whose help you know Jesus was arrested and brought before uh, Pilate so uh, Jesus is saying yes you are here you know in this authority because only my father has permitted it but whatever decision you are going to make you know you are going to be responsible for your choices for your decisions along with you know the Jewish leaders and Judas uh, who made the wrong decision uh, who delivered uh, uh, you know uh, Jesus to be a uh, uh, to be arrested and then to be crucified. The third thing is, uh, you know, government's responsibility, God's permission uh, or a governing authority uh, is, uh, you know, appointed by God. It does not mean that, um, you know, uh, the leader's character, motives, decisions, actions uh, are all, you know, 
led by God, it's God's will, it's approved by God. Um, so we can't say all of the wrong actions, the wicked things that, uh, you know, these rulers do, dictators do, uh, is all led by God, directed by God, approved by God, because he has permitted them to be leaders, no. Is permitted them to be in that leadership position, but you know, all of their actions, their decisions, their choices, everything, they are going to be accountable for their own words and their own uh, uh, actions. Like we read in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15, it says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. So each one of us will be judged you know, for our decisions, the choices that we make. The fourth thing we uh, learn about, uh, you know, from scripture, even as we're trying to answer um, this first question, you know, is uh, uh, so our governing, governing authorities uh, in this position, uh, because they are appointed by God. So what about corrupt, unjust and wicked leaders? Uh, we are answering this question and the fourth thing is you know uh, the people of the land are responsible for the kind of government uh, that is in leadership okay so the choices and actions of the people of the land influences who comes in the place of authority over them okay we learned about this again in uh, when we in your second year uh, in the course uh, kingdom builders Okay, uh, we, you learned, I hope you remember that, you know, it says that, that a nation always receives the government it deserves. So if a nation is filled with people who are corrupt, who are unjust, who have no regard for uh, godly moral values, then we will have a leader who does the same. Uh, because, you know, after all, all of the leaders have grown up uh, from the same community from the same people that they live uh, among but uh, if you know if people change then the government will also change so the government is an expression of the people it represents uh, so if you have a wicked government it basically uh, uh, or a government that is a dictator that is a dictator or a government that uh, there is no moral ethical values or uh, there is corruption, it's basically because these leaders have grown up in the society, in the same nation, in this, among the same people, where they have learned these same things. So it's important that, uh, you know, we teach the coming generations about, uh, you know, right moral, ethical values, godly values, uh, kingdom lifestyle, kingdom values, kingdom principles, because if we fail to teach our generation, then, you know, uh, the nation that we live in will turn out to be far worse than it is in the present situation. So I hope you're all able to see the importance of uh, ministering uh, to children. You know, um, I've been in children's ministry for the last um, 22 almost 24, 25 years now. It's sad to see that many of them who graduate from Bible college don't want to minister to children. Um, uh, basically, they feel that they can't relate to them uh, or they don't see the importance of, uh, you know, inculcating godly values. But it's so important and it's so important in the sight of God because even God tells the people, uh, the Israelites, you know, when you celebrate the Passover or the festivals, tell your children, you know, enact the whole scene, what happened, you know, tell your children. So the generations, the generations to come uh, will know the mighty acts, the mighty deeds of the Lord, uh, their God. And also, you know, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, we see in the Old Testament repeated, you know, uh, uh, throughout, you know, teach the generations to come. We see Moses, you know, whole of uh, Deuteronomy, you know, Deuteronomy, the second law, it's not that, you know, the, the law was given the second time, it's basically Moses reiterating the laws to a new generation that come had come up. Uh, but it's a sad thing to read, I think it's in the book of Judges, in the last few verses in the book of Judges, it says, then a generation that grew up who neither knew the ways or the deeds of the Lord, their God. 
Why? Because the previous generation had failed to teach the uh, the younger uh, generation. And I think that's the same thing that's being repeated even now. Uh, you know, uh, we fail to teach our children godly values and ethical moral values. And so C is so important for us uh, to teach them, uh, not only children in uh, who come to church, uh, you know, uh, but also we sometimes we see Sunday schools in churches, you know, uh, they just tell them a story, the same old story, Jonah, Zacchaeus, uh, you know, those uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000 uh, and just leave it at that. So the children know the story, but, you know, they don't know, they're not, um, they're growing up to, uh, you know, uh, to have a form of godliness, but denying its power. You know, and this, uh, we also know the importance of teaching uh, children uh, in schools. So, you know, at uh, APC, we have uh, uh, a school outreach ministry where we go and teach uh, scripture to all children uh, in schools. And I hope, you know, uh, people are able to see the importance because here, you know, we are grumbling about our government, leadership, authorities, we're looking at governments and leaders who are coming, who are so, uh, you know, dictators, who are so selfish uh, and so corrupt. Um, and, uh, you know, our responsibility is that we train the younger generation, uh, you know, Others will have a generation that rises up to be even far worse than the generations that have preceded us and the generation that exists even uh, today. Okay. So in Proverbs chapter 28, verse uh, uh, 2, it says, Because of the transgression of the land, many are its princes, but a man of understanding and knowledge, right will be prolonged. So you see that, you know, if you, uh, you know, speak wisdom and understanding into uh, people in the land, we see that, you know, the right will prolong. That means the right ways, the right things will prolong, will grow, uh, will uh, have a lasting impact and an effect on the lives and, uh, and the minds of uh, people. The fifth thing uh, uh, in answer to the question is God can stir the leaders for a specific um, purpose. Uh, so God can change the heart of a uh, king and a leader. We know this very um, uh, familiar verse in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like a river, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he uh, wishes. Okay, so we know that God can stir the heart of a, of, a, of the government, of the wicked ruler, uh, can uh, change him. Uh, and so what do we need to do? All we can do is pray. Uh, the more the people pray for the land, for their government, for those in leadership and those in authority, you know, we can we see that God can move their hearts to bring about uh, his plans and his um purposes. So in Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 8, we just looked at a few quest, uh, questions that we answered. Uh, but basically in Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 8, Paul is saying that we are to submit to government authorities. We are to give them honor, uh, give honor to whom honor is due. We need to recognize them uh, in leadership, in authority, because they are part of the institution that God has put in place, uh, even if they're ungodly, even if they're corrupt or wicked, we recognize that God can still work out his plans and purposes even to them, just like he worked it out through Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, you know, Cyrus. Uh, but ultimately, God is, uh, is final authority. Uh, so God can override and stop them. God can intervene. He can override the wrong, uh, the intent to do. Uh, but that is in response to our prayers and from our side. We need to pray for the government of our land, for the for the leaders that rule us, uh, the future leaders that come into uh, power. Okay. So uh, scripture teaches us here that we need to respect uh, those in government, uh, in authority. We need to honor them. Uh, we should not fight against uh, what uh, leaders are doing as long as it does not violate what God has uh, said. So to what extent, uh, the next question that can rise up in our minds is to what extent can we submit uh, to governing authorities? Okay, uh, we submit to them to the extent as long as they do not contradict the laws of God. Um, 
and when it comes to them contradicting the laws of God, in such cases we obey God uh, and not man. Okay, so let's look at an example here in Acts chapter 4 and continues on to Acts chapter 5. You know, Peter and John are commanded not to preach or teach in the name of, uh, uh, sorry, Jesus. And uh, uh, what does uh, Peter and John answer? You know, he's, they say that, uh, you know, uh, you know, you judge, he's, he's telling the people and those in authority, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God. So he's asking them to judge. Should we listen to, to man or we need to listen to uh, God? And the same thing, you know, Acts chapter 5, verses 28 to 29, they were strictly commanded not to teach in his name, um, but they, uh, you know, they say that, uh, and they say that if you preach and teach, then, you know, if you are killed, uh, you know, then the blood will not be on us, but will be on you because you've already warned you. Uh, but Peter and the other, other apostles, they answer and say, we ought to obey God rather than men. So, yes, you know, we're supposed to submit to government authorities, rulership uh, that is there, um, the government that is there but times when you know when uh, they contradict the laws of god if they come against the laws of god we obey god rather than uh, man so for example you know if the government of the land tells us we don't preach uh, the gospel we need to obey the law uh, but uh, you know um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 do we obey the law of the land or we do obey the mandate of God? Uh, yes, we must be careful not to, uh, you know, go against government authorities, uh, which means we don't use, uh, you know, people's uh, homes, uh, we don't use our office spaces or uh, we don't use uh, public places just to preach and teach because we need to submit to the law of the land, to the government authorities. But at the same time, you know, we can preach or teach in our own homes. Uh, you know, we can preach and teach in churches, uh, you know, uh, uh, in homes where uh, uh, or in halls where people are gathered, where Christians are gathered, we can preach and uh, teach. But uh, at the same time, we obey the mandate that God has given to us and also be careful not to violate other people's personal space or the government's personal space or, uh, uh, you know, the, the law that they have put. Uh, so we, we don't use other people's homes or office spaces or other public areas to preach and teach, but we can, it's okay to use our own homes or uh, you know, uh, uh, the buildings that we have, the so-called churches to preach and um, teach, okay? Another question that uh, can rise up is, should we not raise up our voices to ex express our concern or stand for injustice or wickedness? Uh, yes, while we submit to the government, while we honor them, uh, it does not imply or does not mean that we don't raise up our voices, we don't uh, use our uh, so-called rights as citizens or our freedom as people to express our ideas, to raise our voices, our concerns against injustice and wickedness, uh, but we don't do it in a way that is... Um, uh, you know, that is causing harm and danger to others. Uh, we do it in the right way uh, where we can be heard, uh, which will not cause about any turmoil or any curfew or any unwanted, uh, you know, killing of people. Uh, but we can, uh, yes, raise our voices against injustice and wickedness. We can speak it, but in the right way, in gentleness, in peace, in love, in patience and uh, self-control. Okay. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 5 says, take away the wicked from before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. So if we have to apply this verse in our modern day context, it means, uh, you know, if people raise their voice of righteousness before leadership, then they can help the government be established in uh, righteousness. So sometimes when we raise up a voice, uh, to the truth uh, against wickedness, injustice, when actually, you know, uh, uh, before leadership, uh, we are actually helping the government to establish, uh, you know, a government uh, or a law or a rule or to execute righteousness and, ju uh, and justice. But yes, we uh, need to open our mouths and uh, plead the cause of the poor and needy, as we read in Proverbs chapter 31, 
verses 8 and 9. I'm basically today just following the notes, so I'm just going through it, and I'm just assuming all of you have your notes and you're following along with uh, me, okay? Uh, it's very interesting uh, in, in this uh, chapter, uh, in verse 7, you know, uh, Paul refers to the governing authorities, he calls them as God's ministers, okay? Uh, basically, the word minister uh, is similar to the English word uh, for deacon, and it basically represents, uh, you know, God's intent for governing authorities, that what is God's intent or what is his ideal for governing authorities is that, you know, they be ministers of God in the way that they live, in what they do. But many of them we know fail in this calling, they fail in their practice, in the way they're living their lives. But as long as, um, you know, um, they are doing uh, things in righteousness uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, and when we speak against injustice, uh, uh, what we do is uh, uh, we do it in a framework of uh, the rights and, uh, uh, you know, the freedom that we have. We know that we can raise up our voice against injustice and against unrighteousness. And we know when we do that, uh, as the verse says, as we just um, uh, read in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 5, the throne will be established in righteousness. That means the government can be helped uh, to establish righteousness in the way they rule, the way they execute things here on um, earth. Okay. We'll just move on. Anyone has any questions so far? So basically, in verses 1 to 7, Paul has been uh, talking about uh, or telling us to submit, to obey the government authorities. In verses 3 to 5, uh, he says we are to submit uh, to governing authorities. Uh, in verse 5, in verse 3, he says, why should we submit to governing authorities so that we can receive their approval? In verses 4 to 5, uh, 4 and verse 5, he says, so that we can avoid punishment. So if you don't want to get punished, don't want to be put into jail, then you submit to governing authorities. And then in verse 5, he says, for your own conscience sake, you know, submit to government authorities. And in verse 6 and 7, he says, pay taxes, give honor, and what is due to the government. Okay, we'll move on to verses 8 um, to verses uh, 14. Can somebody read verses 8 to 14, please? Verses 8 to 14. <coughs> Can I read those? Yes, yeah, sure, Queen. Thank you. Okay. Romans uh, 13, 8 says, uh, Oh, no one, uh, anything except to love one another. For he who loves an another has fulfilled the law. For the commandment says, You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. Thank you. So in. Um you know, was uh, eight. Paul uh, says the key to you know submitting to governing authorities, to obeying them, uh, you know, to do everything that is required of us. The key is love. Okay, we know it. He knows that it's difficult for the Christians to obey the government authorities, especially in Rome, because of how the Christians are persecuted. But he says the key is love. So he says if you love, you will do no harm to your neighbor uh if you love god then you will you know automatically keep his law so basically when you love people you will keep the law of god you will love them in return you will do all that is required that is essential of you that is required of you and he says loving people is essentially the fulfillment of the law because when we walk in love you know we keep all other 
commandments and we know uh, you know it's talked is spoken about or explained to us in one uh, John so loving people is essentially the fulfillment of the uh, law which is the greatest commandment Jesus said love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart soul mind and strength and love your neighbor as your self okay so that is the greatest commandment so when we fulfill the law of you know when we uh, for, uh, when we love people you know it helps us to fulfill the law because we walk in love and we you know we're able to keep all other commandments as well so love must be the standard in which we look at things in which we do things and why uh, the motive of why we are doing what we are doing in verses 11 to 14 he talks about uh, personal life of a believer and the way the believer needs to uh, live okay uh, we'll stop here it's time we look at um, verses 11 to 14 in the next class anyone has any questions Any questions? Any questions about the assessment? Was it fine? Was it okay? Okay. No questions? Uh, Pastor, yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. where, where do we draw a line between uh, uh, obeying, obeying uh, leaders as the Bible, Bible uh, command us, and when they cross the line, where we say, "Okay, this is enough. We cannot uh, obey you. We have to take matter in our own hands." Or things. Where do we draw the line? Is, is there a line, or we, we have to obey them all the way? Thank um, you. Master. Good question, Mangi. Uh, so I think when it comes to the law of God. You know, when it's uh, asking us to go against the law of God, the standards of God, but he's asked us that time we choose to obey the law of God. And we know that when we obey the law of God, uh, we can be persecuted, we can suffer harm, uh, but we are asked to obey God rather than man. Of course, God will take care of things. He will help us. Um, there are times when people were persecuted, even killed, murdered, uh, died because of uh, they obeyed God rather than obeying man. Um, you know, like for example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, uh, so where did they draw the line? They had to make a stand. They made a stand. What about Daniel? You know, uh, asked not to pray to the king the next 40 days. Or, you know, but he comes back to his house and he does the same thing that he does every day. So when it comes to God and man, uh, like we looked at the example in Acts 4 and 5, you know, uh, Peter and John and the other person says we rather obey God rather than, uh, we need to obey God rather than man. That is what is right for us to do. So yes, that is where uh, we make the decision and we choose and we have to go by what God is asking us to do. That is where we draw the line. Does that help, Mangi? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, if there are no questions, then we'll end class. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'll I'll meet you all again on Friday. Till then, have uh, a blessed week. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Prabhakar. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Supachit. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Say.